Father, we bless you and praise you. We thank you for all that has been said and done. We thank you for the time of prayer, the time of praise unto your name and lifting up your name in song. We thank you for everyone that has been involved in this service thus far. We ask that you bless them for giving of their time and their talents and their treasure. Father, as you, we proclaim this new series, we ask that you will just fill our hearts with your word yes, and that it will manifest in us and that we will grain, uh, and that we will grow and have great fruit that you will be proud of. We bless and honor you this day. Yes, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. We are starting a new series, starting a new month, and um, back in the 1800s when I went to school, September, the Tuesday after Labor Day was the first day of school, but that has all changed now. Most folks start in August, some as early as July. But what I want to talk about today and for the month of September is that there is a popular saying that says, share the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. So, in order for us to get a great understanding of this, we want to look at our premier example, who is Jesus himself. And so, What we want to look at with this being, as we talked about earlier, the month that, is, that has been designated as National Back to School Sunday on the 17th, the third Sunday of the month, we want to understand how we can proclaim the gospel but not only how we can proclaim but understand the necessity that it is to proclaim the gospel the necessity of proclaiming the gospel the need the necessity of proclaiming the gospel. There are us that have seen many men and women standing on street corners declaring the oracles of God and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand but we're going to do this invisibly. Raise your hand invisibly if you used to laugh at them street corner preachers. Now don't smile, because if you smile, then you're still giving yourself away. <laughs> but that was what they knew, and that's what they desired to do in order to meet the request of our scripture for today. Our scripture from the day, for today comes from the book of Matthew, starting at the 28th chapter and we're going to look at the 19th and the 20th verse. Matthew, the 28th chapter, the 19th and the 20th verse. And if you've been around ministries for a while, this is a very 
familiar scripture. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Amen. And so what we see here, if I could build this up, is that Jesus has returned, and he is now getting ready to go up into heaven. But before he departed, he wanted to lay down a final discourse to his disciples. And the final discourse, if you look at the 18th verse, it's, he says, All power or all authority has been given to me. And he says, Because all power has been given to me, now what I want you to do, because you are my disciples, is to go tell everyone about what it is you know about me. And so he says, go ye therefore and teach, not just the Jewish folks, but teach all folks. And after you have taught them, then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then after that, you continue to teach them to observe everything that I have told you, everything that I have commanded you, you begin to teach them. Mm -hmm. And as opposition comes, he's bringing out, he says, I am with you. Because of the authority that I have been given, I will be with you and even unto the end of the world. And so now we see how all this is now set up. That because we are disciples of Jesus, we now have what we call in the military our marching order. Our marching orders were not to stand by. The first word in that 19th verse is this. Go. Go. Now, if you are from our southern states, mm -hmm. you would have heard it say, go. <laughs> like you got to go. There, there's a action that is involved in this. There's, there's something that you have to do. You can't stay where you are. There is a pushing out from where we are comfortable to where God wants us to arrive. So he says, go now. And as he says, go, he is saying that I'm going to be with you no matter where you go. As long as you are walking according to what I have commanded you. So it requires us to listen, number one, remember, number two, and speak, number three. We have to hear and remember and speak. Hear, remember, and speak. Hear, remember, and speak. Because what it requires for us to do is to change everything that we may have been taught in order to walk in what he has declared unto us. And so here we are, and it says, Go therefore. The next thing that we have to do is provide instruction. So that means that there requires some understanding by the teacher. 
So we hear him say to go. We remember what he told us. And so then we proclaim it. We begin to speak it. But not only do we speak it with our mouths, but we speak it in our conduct and how we move forward in revealing who Jesus is. Some have found themselves in situations whereby your actions indicate that you are different than everyone else. There used to be an expression when we were coming up in the 1800s that when you would do like everyone else, your parents would ask you if they jumped off a bridge, would you jump off the bridge too? And their point was, think about what you are about to do and don't just follow along with the crowd. And so what we want to pull out of these scriptures is first the thing, first thing that Jesus says is for us to go. So that means get out of where we are and arrive at a different location. The next thing is that he wants us to teach. And in order for us to teach, we have to have something to teach. And that teaching is not just a lecture is just not a standing in front of somebody and providing them with a discourse or a communication or debating someone. It's also tied into how we conduct our lives. Remember when we first started discussing this series. It says share the gospel at all times. And when necessary, when needed, use words. Because people watch. And because they watch, sometimes we teach more by what we do than what we say. That ties into another thing. That One of the things that we used to hear when we were coming up, do as I say not as I do. And that would cause some issues in the mind of the children, the teenagers, the young adults. It would cause some confusion because we don't speak as often as we do. And so what we desire is for us to have a correlation between what we say and what we do. So we do not have to add this, just do what I said. Mm. Don't do what I do. How many of us today now look at some things that we're doing and we'll tell our children, don't do this because I'm doing it. You shouldn't be doing this. But that is not computing to the <laughs> child. Because what you do speaks volumes over what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's why this, when necessary, is so significant. Because we are just looking at the fact that we should be sharing the gospel at all times. So our whole life should be reflecting the gospel at all times. And then when it's necessary, when it is needed, then say something. All right. Then speak. Okay. So he says go. Then he says teach, provide instruction. And this is the significant thing about the gospel. The gospel is not, an in, the intention of the gospel is not to be us opening up someone's mouth, sticking a funnel down there, and stuffing it down their throat. This is not what the gospel is about. It's not a, a bunch of rules and, and regulations. It's not a bunch of, of, of legalism. But what the gospel is, is freedom. Mm -hmm. It's freedom from the concern that you have regarding 
your life. It's freedom because that what that is what the gospel does. The gospel provides freedom. The church that I grew up in, the model for the church was this. You have a right to be free. And that is the gospel truth. You have a right to be free. You don't have a right to be walking in legalism and regulations and all this, but you have a right to be free. And this freedom is based upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. The freedom that we get is not a necessarily physical freedom, but it is a freedom from the fear and the bondage that life will try to put you in. So what we want to walk in is a knowing that I don't have the ability to walk in freedom unless I have someone that can free me. The freedom is established in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. It is not established in anything that I can say or do. The gospel is this, that Jesus died. And because he died, he paid the price of salvation. And he has made it free as a gift unto all men. And all you have to do is accept the gift. There is some of us who, when someone offers us something, we ask 50,000 questions before will accept it. There's others of us that say, no, I don't want it. And then there's others of us that are snatched out that person's hand. And I don't mean snatch, I just mean take out of a person's hand as quickly as they set it out. And it's the same thing with this gospel. Some of us are asking all these questions and some of us just don't want it and some of us realize that we somebody is providing us with a gift that will benefit us and I'm not trying to put anyone in any specific category but I just want you to think about it in your mind what type of person are you? Are you the one when someone offers you something, you ask them 50,000 questions? Are you the one that says, no, no, I don't want it, I don't want it, when you don't even know really what it is? Or are you that person that just says, oh, this is for me, and take it thank you. and say, thank you? Which one are you? And so, we have this, Jesus says go, so we go. Jesus says teach, so that we teach. So we heard what Jesus said, we remember what Jesus says, we repeat what Jesus says with our actions and, when necessary, with our mind. And after we have taught, and folks then acknowledge that they have received, or that their need has been met, then he says, what we want to do is have a public exhibition of the inner change that has happened in your life. And baptism is just that. It is us showing to the public, to those that are around us, that something has changed within us. We realize that we cannot achieve on our own, but through Jesus, we are able to achieve all things. And so when we do this, we then walk in a newness of life. But even after walking in this newness of life, our perspective changes because we have accepted Jesus. Jesus says it doesn't stop there. Because then it 
you look at the 20th verse, he says, teaching. Previously, he just said, teach. Now he says, teaching, which is an indication of the process of teaching. It's a continual movement, an educational process, so that you can begin to grab hold of the concepts, the commandments, the philosophies, the principles of what Jesus has commanded. And Jesus says this, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And so, not only do we go, not only do we teach, not only do we baptize, but then we get into the continual process of teaching. Because discipleship is based upon us sharing with someone else and teaching them what we know. The greatest thing that you can do for a teacher is this. Apply mm -hmm. the message. Live the teaching. One of the things that when I'm teaching certain classes, I have to have my class assist me with my assessment of my ability to teach. And so leading up to that time, I explained to them that on such and such a day, I'm going to need uh, for us to do an assessment so that I can verify that my teaching skills, my teaching ability provided you with a way to retain what I was teaching. Now, those that know me will say, you calling it an assessment, I'm calling it a test. I say, you can call it what you want to. But what I want to look at is the fact of how well was I able to take what I am showing or revealing and teaching you and seeing how you were able to retain it. And what do I need to change in order to ensure that you are getting a good understanding? One of the favorite scriptures that I talk about is Proverbs, the first chapter the seventh verse. And it says, in all you're getting, get an understanding. That's the B part. And so, you call it a test, I call it an assessment of a teacher. Tomato, tomato, you know, we're not going to get all into that. But the thing is, we need to know what it is that we're able to to retain. Because what is going to end up happening is the student at one time should become the teacher. And in order to maintain the integrity of what is intended to be taught from the beginning, there has to be a transference of the understanding of what is being taught. I don't know if you've ever played this game. I was watching a video of a party. And they sat <coughs> some folks up in a circle. And a person walked up to another person and whispered something in their ear. And then the requirement was for that person to then whisper what was said by the first person in their ear. They called that game telephone when we were coming up. And so you would receive some information in this ear and then you were required to then tell another, the next person beside you what it was mm -hmm. that you heard said. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the funny thing about that game is 99, uh, I'll drop down just one percentage, 98% of the time, what was said initially is not what is said at the end. There is some uh, deviation from the message when it comes to the end. So what we want to establish is, as we look at the, uh, I'm still on that word teaching, mm -hmm. is there's a process. It's not just a one time being taught. There's a constant teaching. Right. That's why in Romans it says, faith cometh by hearing mm -hmm. and hearing by the word of God. So faith doesn't come by one instruction, but it comes from us repetitively hearing the word, hearing the word, and hearing the word, and then <coughs> applying it to our lives so that it can increase our faith, confidence in what God can do in us and through us. And so today, as we're bringing this one, this first, Iteration to a close. You know I got to give you that sticky note. And our sticky note for this week is going to be this. Discipleship, which is what we're talking about, <coughs> is sharing. That's all it is in a nutshell. That's all Jesus is saying. When he's saying go and teach and baptize and continue to teach, He's saying, go forth and share. So discipleship is sharing. It's not hoarding or excluding. <coughs> so discipleship, and we already said when you add that ING, it becomes something that we do constantly and continually. So sharing, continuing to share and sharing some more. That is what discipleship is. Discipleship is not getting this information and these commandments from Christ and hoarding them like on the television there is a series called <coughs> Hoarders. And if you had taken the opportunity to watch Hoarders, you would know that a hoarder sometimes causes issues in their own lives. Hmm. The issue is that they start collecting different things and they hold these things in the place that they live and it gets to the point whereby other things come to live with them. Because they have stacked so many things up in there, they've caused a, con a congestion in their household. And they can't ensure that the house is as clean as it needs to be. They then allow insects and rodents and things in the house. And then, on this show, these were extremists, so they would have to sometimes put on biohazard suits to walk into these houses because of the hoarding of the person. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be hoarders of the word. No. Because if we hoard the word, and we just take in the word, take in the word, take in the word, and do not share it, it then starts becoming this contamination in our lives mm -hmm. and becomes a weight because it's not meant to be hoarded. It's not meant to be contain this word is meant to be shared uh -huh. and to touch other people's lives. Yes. And finally, the word uh, is not meant to be excluded. We don't get to decide <laughs> who should receive the word. We need to ensure that we are providing opportunity to everyone that we meet have the opportunity to share. Uh -huh. And so as we look at this sticky note and think about it this week, discipleship is sharing. It's not hoarding, 
or excluding. It is sharing. So what are you doing today to share? One of the things that I would tell you that you may want to do is go on a mission trip. And you're saying, well, well what do I need to do to go on a mission trip? Walk next door to your neighbor. <laughs> As I said, this month has been designated the Back to Church Sunday month, the third Sunday of this month. What does it hurt to go for and ask your neighbors to come to church? The Barnard Research Group says that most of the folk that come to church come because they were invited. And so as we look at this, they bring it up, they break it down like this. It says only 4% of unchurched adults were invited to church by a friend and actually went. 23% were invited but declined. And 73% weren't invited uh, at all. And so what we have to look at is why is this not happening? Number one is because Christians are not establishing relationships with non-Christians. What? You want us to fellowship with the non I didn't say fellowship. Just establish a relationship. Relationship can be based on many levels. Every time you see the person, you say hello. That's establishing a relationship. I didn't, have, you, I didn't say you had to go have dinner with each other. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying that we have to develop a relationship, a friendship with a person in order to establish that relationship, which thereby will allow us then to share the good news. Another thing, that, another philosophy that we need to look at is folks say, well, you know, I don't want to be involved, you know, in the church because they're doing all this stuff. But what we want to do is by our lifestyle, show them that their perception may not be their reality. Yeah. Oh, that's the sticking note from last week. But what we want to look at is revealing to them by how we conduct ourselves mm -hmm. what true Christianity looks like. All right. And so as we look at this, somebody may be saying, you're talking, you're trying to make all of us evangelists. I'm not trying to make you an evangelist. I'm just trying to get you to walk in the spirit of evangelism. An evangelist is someone who has been made and, and, and gifted by God to preach the good news. But all I'm to asking you for you to do is just to share the good news. Mm -hmm. Because discipleship is sharing, mm -hmm. not hoarding it's nor more. excluding. And so we want to walk in the process of being a friend, mm -hmm. establishing relationships, letting folks know the good news of Jesus. Because if it's good enough for you, don't you think it should be good enough for them? And so, as we, this is my third close, so it's the final. <laughs> so, as we come to the final closing, there's a couple questions I want to ask you. First question is, how did you come to know Jesus? How did you come to know Jesus? And finally, What if no one had shared the story of Jesus with you? Where would you be? Where would you be? Our sticky note is, discipleship is sharing, not hoarding 
or exclude. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this series that we should share the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Let our actions, God, speak volumes to our lifestyle. Let our lifestyle glorify you in all things. That you will be lifted up and that folks will see that you are in our lives and that Jesus is what they are missing and what they need for the success that they desire, for the peace that they desire, for the comfort that they desire. We thank you for this word today, and we ask that it will fall upon the good soil of our hearts and gain great root, and that it will become mighty oaks, that you will be glorified in all things. We thank you and honor you for it, in your son Jesus' name, amen. amen.